Hello, everyone, and welcome to Catholic Saints. My name is Taylor Kemp. I am the Director of Formed, and with me is... Dr. Ben Akers, Chief Content Officer here at the Augustine Institute. Yes, and today we are talking about St. Ignatius of Antioch. Dr. Akers, what do we need to know about St. Ignatius of Antioch? Many things. We're not going to cover all the things in our short 18-minute no. episode, but he, I, I just want to say he's one of my favorite saints. Okay. One of my favorite saints of all time. Yeah. He is a model of Christian discipleship. Okay. His martyrdom becomes kind of a, a manual for martyrdom, is how one Christian wow. writer put okay. it. But he's an early church father. Yep, okay, so yeah. And he's also a doctor of the church. Okay, so he he died, what we know about him uh, biographically is he died around 107, so right. we're talking very early Exactly, so possibly a uh, birth date around 30. Wow, yeah. He had, we know from St. John Chrysostom, who is a bishop in Antioch, so he's Ignatius of Antioch, bishop uh, later... St. John Chrysostom, many, you know, a couple hundred years later, mm -hmm. said that Ignatius of Antioch had the see, was bishop for 40 years in Antioch. That's a long time. So I wow. kind of count that back. Yeah. Eusebius is the early church historian. He says that Ignatius is the third bishop of Antioch. Mm -hmm. Do you know who the first bishop of Antioch is? No. St. Peter. So think of Acts, St. Peter the Apostle. Yeah. So in Acts chapter 11, when the apostles, you know, yes. apostles are scattering, they're going different places. Yep. Peter <laughs> goes to Antioch. I remember me. that. Yeah. He goes to Antioch. Antioch's the first place where they're called Christians. Christians, very yep. good. And it's interesting, Ignatius is going to be the first, Ignatius of Antioch is going to be the first one to use the word Catholic for church. Mm. So Antioch is famous for that. First time place called Christian, Christians, first time called Catholic. Catholic. Wow. So the Eusebius tells us that Peter is the first bishop of Antioch. Wow. Evodius, who do we, we don't know anything about, is the second bishop, and then Ignatius is the third bishop. So the, so how do we know anything about Ignatius? He's so old. Yes. How do we... Yeah, so Saint, uh, so Eusebius is a is uh -huh. a early Christian writer. He wrote what's called the, the History of the Church, mm -hmm. and he tells us different stories about the lives of the apostles, some stories that aren't in Scripture. So he mm -hmm. tells us stories about St. John the Apostle and the Evangelist and mm -hmm. what his, the end of his life looked like. But he also tells us uh, what's happening in the first couple hundred years after um, after Jesus' death wow, okay. and resurrection. And then f we also know a little bit more just rather than just being told about him, we have some... Uh, exactly right. We have we, exactly we have seven letters mm -hmm. that Ignatius writes okay. to d people and also churches yep. on his way for to death in, in Rome. Rome. So he's in Syria. So he's in Asia Minor, and he's heading over towards Rome mm -hmm. to face the lions and be martyred. And mm -hmm. he writes these seven letters. So we actually have handwritten letters that yeah you can him. find these you're you're holding a book there uh, yeah some this is early is... christian writers so it has other writers in it as well yeah. but you can find this on newadvent.org is a website you can have that has free free resources to find these letters and it's just interesting one of our you know both of our one of our favorite saints is saint john henry Cardinal newman mm -hmm. he says about these seven letters of ignatius mm -hmm. that all of Christian theology yeah, I remember in outline that. form can be found it's in these seven letters i remember uh in the graduate school here uh, learning that all of theology, the seeds of all theology, can be found in Saint Paul's letters, mm -hmm. and then I remember that uh, hearing that the all of theology can be found in Saint Ignatius. I was like, that is so cool. That's amazing. What's neat about Ignatius is that he's very, as you mentioned, Saint Paul. He's very Pauline, so you can actually mm -hmm. see that he, you know, the way he's thinking about Christ, the way he's thinking about God, and the way he's thinking about the Church is very Pauline in its nature. Okay, very nice. So. Um, he, we have these seven letters. So, what what are some of the themes, or wh where should we begin when we are in talking about these letters that we have from him? So, he is called by Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, referred to him as the Doctor of Unity, and he means unity not only in among the Church, but he also means union with Christ. Mm. So, he's a doctor that describes mystical unity, and what what does that mean? It means that the more that we as Christian disciples are configured to Christ, mm -hmm. the more we're going to imitate Christ, and the more we imitate Christ, the more that actually builds up the bonds of communion among Christians living together. Yeah, and it's a perfect image of the ecclesial understanding of Christ is the head, and we in the church is the body, and yes. that, so like to be united deeper with uh, the head is to be closer to the body in a sense, so that exactly. makes yeah, perfect sense. So con configuration to Christ means also dedication to Christ's body, the church. Yeah. Yeah, right, you can't have one without the other. So some of the first that we see in his writings, he's the first, as I mentioned, to call it the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, some beautiful images, if you're into music and you love musical images, he will describe the unity among believers and, and you believers with the, with the hierarchy, the, you know, the bishop and the deacon and the priest, uh, in terms of musical imagery. So 
he'll talk about it as a chorus and that there's different instruments. So it mm-hmm. sounds very Pauline where Paul yeah. says, we all we can't all be the leg. We the can't hands, all be the hand. You have the, to have different yeah. members with one body. What uh, Ignatius does is takes that image and uses it in terms of a orchestra. Mm-hmm. So we can't all play the violin. We can't all play certain instruments, but we all play the instrument that we are given and we serve mm-hmm. our role in the church and that that gives honor to the Lord. Yeah, and together you can make this great symphony, and and like with Paul's imagery of a body, you need all of it for the body to function, or else mm-hmm. the body doesn't work. Uh, so that, it, that that's really beautiful. I want to ask a little bit about, um, you mentioned the, the hierarchy, so you mentioned bishops, uh, priests. So is that something that we would find in his letters? Because that, that, that seems yep. to me significant, being he is so early... Uh, and, and that you don't exactly find in the New Testament, like, to- completely clearly demarcated... You see, epi- higher- yeah, you see, like, episkopoi, so, like, yeah, overseer, you- which we translate bishop, mm-hmm. and, and the same with his letters. Yeah, so okay. he will actually use the term bishop. Mm-hmm. He'll actually say, where the bishop is, there is the Catholic yeah. Church. Wow. So that, that's how important, that's an important emphasis he puts on the structure of the church. He says that it has to be a community of believers gathered around the bishop and being obedient to the bishop. Mm-hmm. And the bishop is a sign of unity, so back to the unity theme. Uh, to, and his unity is not, and and uh, leadership is not to lord it over others, but right. actually to serve his flock as yep. a shepherd. And this is what Ignatius was excited about, was that he could actually serve as a witness to his flock and the entire church of laying down his life for the sheep mm. in martyrdom. Yeah. It's a beautiful image. And uh, with the with the bishops... There's really, you have to have some principle of unity, right? Yes. Like you can't just go out and everybody kind of figures it out as as you go. And so I think uh, Saint Ignatius of Antioch understood, like, no, as Christianity, because it's so early, Christianity starting to spread. They don't. It's not like everybody has the scriptures. It's not like the mass has even like spread far and wide yet. Uh, and so when you have people and you're wondering, like, how do I know that I'm united with the the universal, the Catholic Church, as you pointed out, that he speaks about, it's like you have to be around the bishop, because as Christ sends out the apostles and the bishops are the successors of the apostles, um, there has to be this link, this this going out uh, that retains or protects, really, um, the unity of faith. And so he's like, you have to be with the bishop, which uh, just is, is is very important, and it's a, it's a miracle that this has continued on through today. It's the coolest thing. I, like, I remember when I was coming into the church, and they pulled up um, the the line of the popes mm-hmm. from Rome, and that we actually have a documented line from uh, P- St. Peter all the way to today, and it's because, well, how else would you ensure that, like, the same message was passed down unless you can see this land? And I was like, oh my gosh, that's the most sensible thing. And I love that this was, like, a problem already. Like, and St. Ignatius of Antioch is saying, this is how you know. You have to be with the bishop. That's right. So don't go rogue. And we're going to, you know, I'm going to have a conversation later with Dr. Seahorn with, for the feast day of uh, Pope St. Clement. And similar, when he writes a letter to the Corinthians, he's like, they, they kicked out their bishop because <laughs> they didn't like him for some yeah. reason. And he's well, like, sometimes you can't, we'd, you know. <laughs> right? So, and they disagree. And he said, you can't do that. Yeah. This is a divinely inspired and in, in instituted office mm-hmm. that you need to respect. Yep. Right. And it's, yep. That's really great. So, okay, so what else can we learn from him? Yeah, so we have, so he mentions bishop, he mentions priest, he mentions deacon. So we already see these offices established. Mm-hmm. We see them in the New Testament, but we also, this that quickly, we have attestation that Ignatius is saying, you know, that this is just a given mm-hmm. in the church this mm-hmm. early. That's one of the things. The other thing is, one of those great teachings that he has is with regards to the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. And uh, he'll use phrases in his letters like, I want to eat the flesh of Christ mm-hmm. in the Eucharist. I want to drink his blood. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, proving that there is belief in the real presence of Christ, right. body, blood, soul, and divinity present in the Eucharist yep. in the first century. Yeah, which is which is amazing. And it, it's it's like, I feel like it's a gift of God's providence that we still have these writings uh, to show that this was the faith of the early church. No, when you're reading this, you, you, you when Protestants read this and even Newman say, you know, this is, you, you get surprised how mm-hmm. Catholic mm-hmm. these letters are. Yeah. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, he's the first one to use the word Catholic, which means just means universal yeah. um, with regards to the church. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I definitely want to talk about his uh, letter to... Is it Polycarp? Or, um, he does have a letter to Polycarp. So Polycarp... Which one is the letter about his martyrdom? That's to Rome. Okay. Uh, he, well, he mentions in each of those, but okay. one of the things that... Uh, since you mentioned Polycarp, 
This is the Polycarp that is, we have a famous martyrdom of Polycarp, his mm-hmm. description of his martyrdom. Uh, but this is the Polycarp that knew St. John, St. John, the mm-hmm. evangelist. It's amazing. So Polycarp knew St. John, the evangelist. Polycarp knew Ignatius yep. of Antioch. There was a legend, um, seems to be just a legend, that uh, the nickname that Ignatius had was Theophorus, which means God-born or God picked him up. Mm. So some attributed it to that he was a little child in Mark 9 that Jesus picks up and says, unless you become like this little child. So the idea that he was That's picked cool. up by Christ, yeah. you know, probably just a legend, but yeah. it's interesting. His nickname was Theophorus. That's cool. Um, I remember in his, when he's talking about his martyrdom, so I don't know if this is the yeah, Polycarp or the Smyrnans or... Uh, whichever group, but he, I remember being struck at how much he, uh, so he's going to Rome. He knows he's about to be fed to animals and that he's going to die. Um, and he says many things that many of which we should talk about, but one of them is he makes this connection with the Eucharist mm-hmm. where yeah. um, not only did Christ give the model for martyrdom in the book of Revelation, Christ is called the first witness mm-hmm. um, to shed his blood. So Christ gives the model of martyrdom um, but then he, he speaks of martyrdom in this like very Eucharistic way, not only in that, like Christ was the first one to give his life, um, but also that the Eucharist is the remembrance of this. And then it, that the Eucharist is what gives him, um, the power to do such a thing. You know, exactly. It is from his letter to the Romans and where he says, I am his wheat and yeah. Christ's wheat ground fine by the lion's teeth to be made purest bread. And bread for Christ. And so the idea is that he sees his death in terms of the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. And he will be ground by lion's teeth. Yeah, that's how he's going to suffer his martyrdom. Um, but what's interesting when he talks about that, th- this becomes, as I mentioned, the manual for martyrs in the sense of do mar- martyrs begin to see their life as conformed to Christ's mm-hmm. life and their death conformed to his death? Uh, we see that already in Acts of the Apostles with Stephen, mm-hmm. where he, you know, there's many yeah. parallels between his death, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. Um, and we start to see in the martyrs of the early church how their martyrdom is conformed to the life of Christ. Mm-hmm. And they see it in the sense of the, it, with regards to the Eucharist, of Christ gave his body and blood for the life of the world. Mm-hmm. I, too, give my participate in that, participate yeah. in that redemptive uh, suffering and sacrifice for the life of the world. And this is actually, you know, when we start this connection between the Eucharist and martyrdom, is this is one of the reasons why the early church and, you know, churches have a relic, a piece of a saint, usually a martyr, that's in the altar. Mm. So every altar that's consecrated has saint relics in it, and for most of the church's history, a martyr's relic in particular. Mm. Because that is the way that you show your most conformity to Christ, the way that, that Ignatius... And then it just, bears fruit, right? And then it bears fruit. The way that Ignatius puts it, just after that line I just quoted, he says, when there's no trace of my body left for the world to see, then I shall truly be Jesus Christ's disciple. Wow. So he's seeing his terms of his following Christ in terms of following all the way to the cross. And it, and it like proves, in a sense, uh, like his conformity to Christ, his fidelity to Christ. There's just an incredibly striking passage in here that I remember um, where he's he's like pleading with the Roman, the, the he's writing this letter to the Romans, he's pleading with them not to stop. Not, yeah. Don't get in the way of my martyrdom. Which is interesting because, so it seems as if he was, a, so he was really truly afraid that when he get to Rome, because he was such a well-known bishop, that someone would, like, someone would pay off the guard and he'd escape. You know, they'd let him out and he wouldn't be able to give his witness <laughs> uh, because he saw that, it, no, I, I really do. So he's writing to the Romans saying, but please don't do, what you yeah. think is, is charity towards me is not charity at all. Yeah. And this is, you know, the same letter. This is the first stage of my discipleship. No power, visible or invisible, must grudge me coming to Jesus Christ. Mm. Fire, cross, beast fighting, hacking, quartering, splintering of bone, mangling of limb, even the pulverizing of my entire body. Let every horrid and diabolical torment come upon me, provided only that I can win my way to Jesus Christ. Mm. He says, I know in your, you think you're going to help me by giving me, but it's like, no, no, I want to prove that I'm a disciple by suffering for him. Whenever I read some of this stuff or uh, other writings from the lives of the saints that are that are about that, that are about mm-hmm. like the embracing of the cross, right? Yeah. Embracing suffering, going to martyrdom, and you're just like, oh my goodness, like I'm not there. I always have to remind myself like this is a, th- this comes, this is a supernatural thing that's going on in these, uh, in these witnesses, these saints, and given it at a particular time to prepare them. And I'm like, okay, like if, if this ever be called upon, like the Lord will provide the grace. We have to say yes to such a thing. But you're just like, oh my gosh, like this is unbelievable. And then I'm always like, Lord, thank, 
thank goodness that you've given us the saints as these witnesses because they Christ forges the path and and he is the path to the father and he shows us the way in which we are to live and then the saints are kind of like constant reminders that it's possible yes <laughs> you're like yes like okay th- like this man shows it so too can I with the lord's grace uh so it's just it's amazing like you read that and it's just so powerful and it's just so not of this world it's it's amazing what he ends so and he get, he does get to give the witness of his life so at the end of his journey he uh, uh, they bring him in on the last day of the games in Rome, mm-hmm. the Sigalaria, uh, the last days of the of, of the games, and they bring him in and they release two lions mm-hmm. and they do Man. pulverize him and eat him. And it's interesting the they they said this is the golden legend. So the golden legend is a, a 12th century document, like it retells some of these stories and it adds fantastical details, but. One of the fantastical details it adds, I think, is fantastic, in that it's. They said that when his, you know, when he gives up his spirit, it smelled as if there was baking bread. And then the games end. He mm-hmm. gives his witness. His disciples come and they take his bones and they bring him back <sighs> to Antioch. Yeah. So much so that Saint John Chrysostom in the fourth century is like, the, his bones right here. We mm-hmm. know we have his bones. And um, where do they end up today? Actually, they're in St. Clement's Church in Rome. So if you actually oh. have been to Rome on a pilgrimage, Pope St. Clement's Church, San Clemente in Italian, uh, he's buried under the high altar there. So he's brought That's back cool. to Rome, and you can wow. visit him today. What an amazing, amazing church father. Church fathers are great. It's the best. No, so I would encourage, you know, so you know, what's the takeaway for us is the closer we are to Christ, the closer we are to others that are also Christ's disciples. So yeah, that's right. a ded- dedication and consecration to Christ allows us to work for the horizontal unity among Christian brothers and sisters, mm-hmm. the more we're focused on Christ. Almost like a, you know, think of a triangle. So the closer you are, we're heading towards the apex of the triangle, yep. which the is Christ, we the closer we start to get to one another. Yep. And then, sorry. No, so no, so if we if you have conflicts at work, if you have conflicts in your family, pray together. It might be that right. pray for that person. It might it's not the thing that you want to do or feel like doing, but it's the thing that you need to do, and that's actually what will solve the the issues. Yeah, and I and I love that um, martyr means witness, uh, and that for Saint Ignatius, like you look at this man, he was what did you say? He was a bishop for forty years or mm-hmm. something, and so like he would. I mean, I'm sure he was. A great bishop, like I'm sure he would have inspired many people, done many great things for the city of Antioch to spread the Christian faith and support people. And when uh, his time had come, his time had come, and the Lord had him give his ultimate witness with his life. Uh, and I feel like another takeaway is for us to be faithful to the place the Lord has given us uh, or placed us, uh, and to give the a faithful witness in that walk of life that we are in, whether that's at work, being a mom or a dad or a friend or um, a mentor, like whatever it may be, uh, and then to always know. Uh, that it is a, a supreme gift of the Lord to allow us to offer our lives in conformity with Christ on the cross uh, for the salvation of souls and for our own uh, sanctification. So he's uh, he, it's just a great story. I mean, he's uh, an incredible saint that it is a joy to reflect on. His feast day is October 17th, so if you'd like to celebrate, it's October 17th. You'll see him in Christian art with images of usually a lion at one's head and one at his feet. <laughs> Um, in icons, beautiful image. And I really do encourage you to look up online, newadvent.org, and you can actually find his seven letters mm. and uh, read them. They're, they're a short read. They're maybe 20 pages in here, yeah. but great spiritual reading. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Get formed. Get watching.